Thank you, Vandello, and welcome once again to Graphically Novel. My name is Josh Wasta, a.k.a. Fallout Fury, and with me is my violator. <laughs> oh, dirty. That's oh, that's false. Oh, my Todd McFarlane at the beginning of every oh, episode. Oh, 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 I don't know if I've ever been so, uh, like, insulted and complimented in the same intro. I think uh, that's that's a first for you. Yeah, nice. No kid gloves this morning. No nice. kidding. <laughs> and with us, as always, the lovely and talented, our, our Wanda? I would say Angela. Uh, Angela. Angela gets much better later. Okay. Our Angela, the lovely and talented Ms. Jennifer Howland, the Baroness of... Thank you. Thank you very much. My pleasure, as always, to re- to uh, introduce a returning friend to That's the right. podcast, Troy Esman. Thank you so much for joining us again. Good to be back. Not so many uh, pages of notes as you had for the boys. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, no, I no. think we all can remember. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no. But I did, I did take notes. I, uh, yeah, I think... In- most of us. Yeah. I, I don't know if I took notes. I think I just stared at it in horror and, and, <laughs> and wondered what went wrong. Oh, no, I did take notes. Shit. So if you didn't know what you were clicking on when you decided to listen to this episode, uh, <laughs> we are doing Spawn today, and we will be discussing the 1997 movie, the 1997 cartoon on HBO, uh, and the 1992 comic, the first six issues. So, Troy, first, welcome back. Yeah. For six, uh, yeah, issues. Yep. Yeah, yeah, that's all right. Volume the first, one. the first volume one of yeah, the TPB. Yeah. Generally, the first trade. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so Troy, how long had it been since you had r- broken out your Spawn comics and and read them? Um, I hadn't read the comics in at least ten years. I had only seen the movie when it came out. Hadn't seen it since. So that <sighs> was that was a fun revisit there, and uh, yeah. I periodically revisited the HBO series. Yeah, uh, I think I'm kind of in the same boat. Uh, I was never huge into Spawn, but I was huge into McFarlane's Spider-Man run. Yeah, uh, his artwork in in Spider-Man was was iconic, and uh, you know, part of like me coming into comics was always that. But the HBO series, for sure, I have come back to um, uh, the the cartoon. Yeah, the movie Jen and I watched together, and I had not watched it in. A very very long time uh and uh i should have done a count of the number of times that jen just under her breath went what the fuck <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah i watched that this morning and uh, my wife was very much in woke up to it was going what is this why is my martin sheen <laughs> why is president bartlett, why is president in, bartlett this? in this <laughs> How many times is it going to say the word apocalypse to him, or you're going to start the apocalypse now? Or I'm going to nail him. Yeah, there's that too. She counted. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, Bear, uh, how long? And uh, uh, Was this a first? No, it was not a first for either. It was first to read the comic, um, but as far as the the series I watched... A little bit when it came out. Um, I didn't have HBO at the time, so it was kind of like if I was hanging out. Actually, I think I watched most of the series with you. Probably. Come to think of it. Oh, back in the day. Yeah, probably. <clears throat> yeah. Um, or maybe when right after I got out of college when I was living with Russ and he insisted on having like the Uber cable package that had everything. No, I remember because the cartoon used to be one of the better uh, $5 Walmart finds. Oh, okay. um, yes. The cartoon used to be like a main stable in that the Walmart bin that you would dive because the top was all like left behind in other Christian movies and you had to go down for anything right, that was really dig. good. Uh, and sp- the Spawn cartoon almost always was in there. Um, I-, I should just break in to say good. Good. <laughs> there were no air quotes when you said good. So I think that we need to just state that. Good for a Walmart $5 bin. Oh, no, I found go- good things in a $5 No bin. air quotes? No air quotes. Like, good, like, it's good, bad. This is, this is bad, bad. The cartoon? Or the movie. Yes. No, the movie okay. was the pretty movie good, was... bad. Like, it, you oh. just kind of look at it and you're just like, oh, Jesus. <laughs> 
I like how Hell is a is a Windows ninety five screensaver, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yep. Well, that's not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, before we go further, uh, I, I have kind of a loose uh, agenda for this, because the first thing I want to talk about, uh, and we will get more into him later when we discuss the cartoon, is the creator of Spawn, Todd McFarlane. <laughs> uh, Todd McFarlane has his place in comic books, for sure. He yes. did a lot no. to move comics forward. He is one of the two uh, founders of Image Comics, which... Yep. Ended up doing some amazing things, Spawn being part of that. Incredible uh, art. Really incredible great artist. Art. Yeah, yeah well, artist. In, in, if you've ever seen the any of the Spider-Man stuff where when he shoots webs, it's not just like a string. It's instead like a cable with other like webs around it. So like it's almost like... Like a like a steel cable instead mm, yeah. of looking just like a web. That was a Todd McFarlane thing. And in fact, his... Uh, ideas for things um, <laughs> against the the uh, editor. He was so popular that the editor of Marvel and him were constantly clashing. But one of the things that happened was all of the other people that were doing Spider-Man at the time had to use McFarlane's model for Spider-Man. Uh, he started uh, doing... Uh, well, he, he started... Uh, his first comics were... Um, Infinity Inc. for DC, Batman Year Two, and an, a run of the Incredible Hulk in the late eighties. Really? Mm. Yes. Uh, to which he had a uh, he had major success, so they moved him to Amazing Spider-Man, and that was like the flagship title. He became so popular, but he was frustrated because he didn't have any creative input. He he wasn't a writer; he was the artist, and the way that Marvel always worked was the writer writes, the artist does art, and never the two shall meet. Right. Uh, so they gave him his own Spider-Man book. The just titled Spider-Man, and so the Amazing Spider-Man uh, run, uh, started in uh, 1990, and they just basically were like, there you go, you have creative control over a Spider-Man comic. And that one became so popular that they had to go to the other artists and writers and be like, okay, Todd's doing this in his run. Uh, you have to make that as part of your like. This is going Incorporate on, those. right? Um, some of the stuff for the better, uh, some of it not. His, for example, his treatment of Mary Jane was atrocious. Uh, Why am I not surprised? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so then, uh, ninety two, he got just frustrated with Marvel. Uh, and he left and formed Image Comics. Um, as we read in the in the book, their three main kind of flagships when they came out were the Young Bloods, which yep. were the idea was it was kind of a street level superhero team, more based in reality. But the idea that superheroes were very quickly become superstars, mm. uh, famous people. There was Spawn, and then there was Savage Dragon, yep. which uh, you know. Uh, it's, it's kind of iconic. It's one of the least known stuff out of out of Image. Like if you're a comic book fan, you're you identify with it. Like you know what Savage Dragon is. Uh, you know, mutant dude out of Chicago. Uh, I kept catching those references in the little like newscast yeah. sections yep. in the comic. Yeah. Yep. Um, but that's the other thing is that Image also had a thing where since they were only launching three titles, they were constantly mixing them so that you would know this was a, a universe. universe. Now, yeah. I don't remember, did did they either get or eventually um, did they have or eventually get Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles? Because there was a Easter egg reference to that yes. in one of those new there was a too. There was a TMNT run <clears throat> for Image. Uh, not at that point, but later. Um, and yes, they, they did a lot of Savage Dragon Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles stuff. Mm. Oh yeah. Yeah. So, so many crossovers. But yes, so that was kind of Image Comics. It, I I liken it to when DC said, you know, we're going to move this stuff to Vertigo. And Vertigo ended up being super... I hesitate to use the word edgy. I would call Image Comics edgy. I would call Vertigo, like, the higher brow, uh, more artistic comic. Because that's where Sandman went. That's right. where, you know, all of the... Uh, Transmitter Problem. That's where all of these... Have you more adult. What the Ultimates became. Yes. Yeah. These these more adult comics. 
Um, and Image was Good the same creature one. from there too, right? Yeah, yeah. Yes. absolutely. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, much more alternative. Yeah, you know, a, you know, a little bit deeper, a little bit more thought to them, not as maybe exciting or uh, explosive or action fat. Yeah, you know, they weren't necessarily as action packed. They were just more. There was more story than than. Right. And well, and both of them were starting in the late, in the early nineties. So, I mean, you really can, can liken it to grunge. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, music wanted, you know, people wanted grunge. People wanted like not, um, not perfect, perfectly styled or, you know, presented. They wanted wanted gritty, gritty, not polished. Right. And generally that's what we talk about when we look back at the nineties and boy, howdy. Do we get a bunch of, of that looking back on it, you know, 30 years later? Well, yeah, and that was actually something Stop I it. wanted to The 90s to was just like 10 years ago. Right? I did, oh, I yeah. did <laughs> want to bring up the, the fact that in the 90s, a lot of this was coming around because um, people of a certain generation were tired of the, like, shiny good guy. They Before wanted, Color World. Yeah, yes. Well, they wanted, they wanted bad guy heroes. Mm-hmm. They wanted heroes that weren't perfect yeah. they wanted right they wanted their who, anti-heroes yeah well yep. but they wanted people who had done bad things struggled with that and then you know came out of it oh yeah this you is know? also when you're seeing uh wolverine really start to hit his stride when you're seeing the punisher start to come back um uh you know daredevil starts to get grittier mm-hmm. um you know, this is the rise of a lot of those artists that started to do a lot of the, the gray area stuff. Right. Neil Gaiman. Yep. He's, he's really, this is his wheelhouse. This is really when he's starting to hit. And actually, after these six issues, um, there were other issues done by Warren Ellis, um, Neil Gaiman. Mm-hmm. Um, McFarlane brought all of these, all of his friends, basically, that had the same experience he did. So, the first six issues, as, as Troy was saying, it's not that indicative of how the series is it's just a good start um really past this point is when you're going to start to get more input from other creatives and todd will take what he likes leave what he doesn't as he will but um he does go out there and be like these are my creative friends this is my you know this is my creation what could we do if we just start working the mill well, and he did say in the beginning of, of that trade that, you know, like the, where, what his thinking in creating Spawn was that none of the heroes were gritty, basically. Right, yeah. And he said Batman was the closest to that, but then he stopped short. He never killed his enemies. Right. And he was like, and that's why I created Spawn, because I wanted a hero that actually killed people. And right. that, again, is very 90s. Well, yes. this is also yes. before Punisher was considered a hero. Yeah. yeah. Punisher was... Still was vigilante. Yes. Yeah. He was still being used in Spider-Man comics as as basically just a bad guy. He had good motivations. Mm-hmm. That had started to be explored, but uh, which was also revolutionary because, you know, bad guys are just bad. You know? The, the closest that they had gotten is basically all of the X-Men comics. Right. Um, the, the Punisher was there to go, what if you take it that next step? Right. And, oh, you shouldn't do that. Right. And then became wildly popular. After uh, the 90s explosion. Yes. Right. Yeah. Um, so all of this culminated in uh, McFarlane being approached, uh, and I, I don't remember which one it is. I did not write that in my notes, but... I believe it was Columbia Pictures that approached him and basically offered him millions for the rights to do the movie. And he refused because they wouldn't give him any creative input. Uh, So he ended up selling to New Line Cinema for a dollar. And only if he could have creative input and keep all the licensing, merchandising rights. Um, So just remember, that trash movie... Oh, <clears throat> Lodge no. McFarland toys, oh, basically. Yeah, no. He's like Lucas. He, yeah. He sold off his rights to the movie mm-hmm. to capitalize on the toy line. Right. Where the money it was. And the comics. Right. Huh? right. Well, Not cartoon. And yeah. to this day, some of the best toys that you can get are McFarland toys. Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he does them not just for the image line anymore. Now he does a bunch of DC stuff. He does yep. a bunch of Marvel. I mean... 
he basically he's up there for quality. Yeah, he started a toy empire off of the back of this shitty, shitty movie. <laughs> so let's talk about the movie. Uh, <laughs> oh, oh, I'm dirty. I feel dirty. <laughs> uh, this is the most '90s movie I think I've ever seen. Like this it, is it checks the boxes. Yes, it sure does. Bad CGI. Uh, introduce a child where there was never one in the comic to be the the, the buddy that gives the motivation to the hero. Right, uh, John Leguizamo. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and so the fart the jokes. only good part of that movie, really. Yes. Yes, John Leguizamo doing a bunch of fart jokes. Yeah, it's John Leguizamo in this. So my brother and I uh, both love John Leguizamo, uh, and we love all of his works. Each of us have one that we don't like. Mine that I don't like is The Pest. His that he does not like is Moulin Rouge. Um, I would say this is way closer to The Pest with with John Leguizamo's <laughs> performance. Uh, yeah, it's just... I mean, it is peak... 90s John Leguizamo. I mean, it's it's his comedy, it's his energy, it's everything else. I can't say it's a bad casting. Um, no, I can't. I can't argue with the casting of him. I, but you can tell that it's it's the late 90s. Let's just have him tell every single joke that comes to mind. It, right. it lacked the the panache. Right. That comic violator slash clown had. Right. The movie was. Targeted to kids, right? Yeah. Right, because uh, you know, not not a bunch of spoilers for the comic because we do want you to read it. But Violator in the comic actually does have kind of, I wouldn't say an agenda, but he is conniving. Like he has a plan, and he does do subtlety a little bit. Yeah. The the clown yeah. in the movie, there's no subtlety. There's no, no like subtext. There's none of that. It reminded me a lot of Jim Carrey in The Mask. Yes. Oh, yeah. 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 The problem is... The problem Without with the, the prop stuff. That, uh, right. Is that uh, the HBO series does a good job of showing Violator being a manipulator. Yes. Mm-hmm. A subtle manipulator. The yeah. way he plays Billy Kincaid and uh, Fat Tony and everyone else against each other instead of, you know, his start in the comic where it was just, I'm killing... I'm Mafia guys, guys are ripping their hearts out. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and I think part of the reason... Um, so when I was first going through this, I'm like, okay, there were better movies with better special effects done. Yes. And to Spawn's credit, I actually looked up the budgets for those movies versus... Um, so Men in Black and Fifth Element were both the same. Ooh. Were both 1997. Really? And I wow. thought... Fifth Element, I was like, okay, Fifth Element I remember as being a lower budget movie because it kind of flew under the radar. No, both it and Men in Black, $90 million. Uh, Spawn started at $20 million and they doubled its budget halfway through. Wow. A third of that extra $20 million went to the special effects. Mm-hmm. Uh, Most of it being uh, his cape. Yes. yes. Yeah, I do remember the cape being, the cloak, whatever being you want a to thing. Call it. I, uh... And I actually now remember watching that movie several times after it came out. Yeah. And and thinking it was it was pretty cool. And then going back maybe like five years later and was like this this movie was not good. What what was I thinking? <laughs> it's a guy what, in a rubber suit. What was I on? With a horrible mask, <clears throat> spouting dialogue. Yep. Uh I mean there's just not a whole lot to say about this movie other than, you know, Yes, the things that they added were, were wrong spots. Um, they, for some reason, made Terry white. I actually had this conversation with, with my wife, and I said, they were progressive in 97. She's like, no, you can't tell me that Todd McFarlane was progressive. Like, <laughs> they, they, took, they took a white actor and cast him into a character that was black in the comics. And... There really wasn't anything lost. Right. Well, and but the reason for that is that McFarlane in an interview said, yes, we didn't want uh, too many African-American characters because that would send the wrong message as to what kind of movie this was. <sighs> wow, he said that out loud. He yeah, sure did. In, in front sure of did. recording equipment. In front of, in front of recording equipment, he, wow. he sure did, he, did. Did he grab somebody by the pussy after that? Or? Yeah, I... 
Well, yeah, gonna run you know, for that's interesting time. because something, and, you know, it's not huge spoiler for the comic, but um, in, the, in the comic, Spawn can appear human, but he appears as a blonde white man. That Which he was is so pissed upset. about. He's so yeah. upset about that. But uh, so I, I find it really hilarious. interesting that that would be an element of the comic, and yet he would not want like maybe that's what he was thinking. Oh well, you know he was a black man, so now we ha- he has to be a white man. And you know <laughs> that's okay. So let's let's unpack that since it came up. Is that better or worse because it was written by a white man? <laughs> I... Well, I mean. The thing that I was thinking about when I when I was reading the comic was, <laughs> is he actually trying to make a statement here? Is there something that he's trying to say? And I came to the conclusion, no. <laughs> no, he's just a dick. He's just not that smart. <laughs> I, I, I would agree with you because the whole context around when he's trying to resume his mortal form right. is he wants to look like himself so he can go and see Wanda. Right. And... He brings up the fact that the Malvolgia was allowing was not allowing his powers to replicate his mortal form, and as a joke, making him appear as a blonde white guy, right. surfer dude. So yeah. it was like, okay, yeah, I'm gonna. It's just putting the screws to him. It wasn't any. I, I don't feel McFarlane was trying to be any kind of subtlety layer here. Yeah. He was just like, what's the absolute most practical joke thing you can do to someone who dra- drastically wants to look like themselves again? Right. right. A different. Different ethnicity, different right. hair color, can right. never pass as who they were. Well, and but I was also thinking that, and, um, you know, what was, were other than, like, I want to reconnect with my wife, um, it, it spawns anger at yes. being, like, I'm a black man. I am not a white man. Which he says verbatim. Yes. He's, he's like, I yeah. am a black man. This is not Which who is I am. why I was like, oh, is, is McFarlane trying to say something here? And then as I read on, I'm like, no, no. Yeah. It's like an Anne Bradstreet poem. You go right to the point where it seems like it's, it's going to say be something. It's going to suddenly And then it's just going to talk about it's God. It's going to suddenly be deep yeah. and thought provoking and then yeah. just, no, we're done. No. That's right. There's your deep cut for this episode. Fuck Anne Bradstreet. <laughs> <laughs> uh,. So, talking about Terry, though, in the movie, uh, I went deep into the IMDb, into the D on this. Okay. <laughs> because it has so much shit about this movie is fascinating. It was so close to being such a better movie. How, yes. much, how much of it was written, how much of the IMDb entry was written by Todd McFarlane? I, I don't know. That's a good question. <laughs> Should have researched that. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Terry was almost played by Edward Norton. Really? Really? That would have changed it a bit. Much different movie. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad my sweet, sweet Edward ran far away from that. <laughs> uh, this was the first film with an African American superhero beating another movie by one month. Do you know what that movie was? Blade. No. Oh. But good guess. Actually, beating Blade by like four months, but oh, okay. the other movie was. Steel with shit. Oh, my oh Jesus! Wow. Uh, okay, I was not aware that wow. was a movie. Oh wait, we watched that trailer. Oh. Remember? Were you there? Were you there when we watched it? Oh God, I don't so know. It, it was when okay. I was doing half-ass research for the Death of Superman yeah. comics. Well, okay, you said that, and then the first thing that popped into my head is when Shaquille O'Neal played a genie. Kazam. 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 Yes. So yeah. It it was very similar to Kazam. It as was you bad, can, as you can imagine, mm-hmm. because Shaquille O'Neal, not the greatest actor in the world. No, no he's no. a funny guy. Though. He's funny, yeah. <laughs> so speaking of who the good actors are, the lead of Al was almost played by several African American men. I'm going to read the ones that didn't turn it down for another project, and then I'm going to have you guess the two at the end and which project they they turned it down for. So. Approached were Cuba Gooding Jr., mm-hmm. Snoop Dogg, Tony Todd, Alan Payne, Denzel Washington, Samuel L. Jackson, wow. Ving Rhames, Tupac Shakur, 
Ladies love Cool James, <laughs> Mr. LL Cool J. Wow. So the two that officially passed for other projects were uh, Will Smith, mm-hmm. who passed for... Men in uh, Black. Yeah. yeah. Yep. And Wesley Snipes. For Blade. Yep. Yep, yep. Much, much Watch better movies. movies. <laughs> good, good move on their part. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Michael Jai White, who played Al, uh, turned down another movie for Spawn. Oof. Except he turned down playing Jax in Mortal Kombat Annihilation. Oof. Oof. So, so ooh. not, I, it I, was, it was a lateral worse. move. Not worse? No, it's not worse. No, yeah. I, think, I think he made the right choice. It was a lateral move. He played, then played Jax well, in Well, okay, yeah, the more he, recent got a, one. he got a lead. Right. In a movie that's not worse. Number two billing over Martin Sheen. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, also. Oh, I forgot about that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Also, Michael J. White uh, is quoted as saying, "There's no footage of me ever saying that I liked Spawn. I've never <laughs> said that, and I thought uh, that was, or or that I thought it was a good movie." <laughs> <laughs> well then. Alrighty. <laughs> so uh, yeah. Sometimes you just need to work to eat. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, and also it was his first lead. Yeah, you know, yeah, you yeah. Take... I really would have loved to have seen motherfucking Spawn though. It's like, <laughs> I'm Spawn, I... motherfucker. No, no, but he he was he saved himself for the what was that noir the where the oh, oh the spirit. Yes, the spirit. Yeah. That was a far <laughs> better role for him. It was. In the it really movie. was. Oh my god. And he has gone on to do even greater things. It's for comic true. book movies. So, yeah, um, yeah. to move on to this next section, I'm going to play something, and I hope the mic picks it up. Because I want people to experience what we experienced. What would you do if at the moment of death, a voice from the darkness offered you the chance to live again? Have your answer? There's no time to think about it. Your heartbeat away from flatlining. Quick, what's the answer? I'm Todd McFarland, and I created Spawn. I hope you'll consider the question I've just posed, because a man named Al Simmons didn't. When the question got popped on him, he signed like some stupid rookie in blood. See, Al had qualities he didn't even know he had, a special kind of wiring that Mel Bozer the devil looks for. And when he said yes to that voice, he signed on for a whole lot more than he ever bargained for. So before you find yourself in a similar situation, and a voice calls to you in the darkness, think of Al. That we used to turn off the lights too. Okay. That is at the beginning of ever. Actually, we did not. None of those introductions were included on the DVD. That is that is the original show on HBO. Yeah, a couple of times that we were actually watching it live. Yeah. Or or HBO Max brought them back yeah. in their original. Yes. So yes. I just yes, want to did. thank Todd McFarlane for giving me this. Because we have been ripping has... on it all <laughs> week. Oh, God. Have you ever eaten really hot pizza? Oh, no. I'm sorry. Uh, if a masochist eats really hot pizza and burns the roof of his mouth, and he can't enjoy the rest of the pizza, but he still has that pain in his mouth, is that better for him, or is it worse? I'm Todd McFarlane, and I created Spawn. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Turn off the goddamn light. <laughs> All I can think about was, was deep thoughts with Jack Hammond. <laughs> but it's just Todd McFarlane. Here, I, two minutes, oh Todd. My go. God. I you thought could... you were stoned Mark Wahlberg there yeah. for a second. <laughs> you could, oh my god, you could plug Jack Handy's shit into... Mm-hmm. Of all my favorite uncles, my favorite uncle was Uncle Caveman. We called him Uncle Caveman because he lived in a cave. And every once in a while, he would eat one of us. I'm Todd McFarlane, and I created Spawn. <laughs> yep. It didn't matter. He he yes. said nothing relevant to the episode. No. no. It's just his two-minute soapbox. Like, well, I, like I said, it's it's him showing up at the beginning of every episode like he is a curator for his own like art you know? gallery with his own art, <laughs> yeah. and he's got to explain every detail to you before you see it because you're too stupid. So I got to say, though... Like, just look at the man, too. Like, have you ever looked at somebody and you're just like, in the way that you dress and the way that you present yourself, 
you just scream douchebag. Right. Like, yeah. you just scream, I am a scuzz bag. Like, and... It, it's, it's his whole attitude screams, I'm a fuckboy. Yes. Yep. Uh, and actually, last year during the pandemic, I did a lot of watching the uh, Comic-Con that they did, because it was basically streaming and free. Yeah. And they had a an appreciation of Todd McFarlane panel. And... Wow. Man. A, you could tell that he put the panel together. Mm-hmm. Wow. You could tell that he knew the questions ahead of time, so he probably curated them. Right. And, like, it was all about, well, you know, people in a lot of these things are at least a tiny bit humble. Yeah. <laughs> there is none of that. That does not yeah. surprise yeah. me. Yeah, yeah. No, no. I mean, like I said, did a lot for it. <laughs> we seem to take these titans of comics and just shit on them. And fortunately, we're not going to have as many episodes on Todd McFarlane as we had on Alan Moore. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I mean, I just yeah, is you could tell that fame went to his head. At least Alan Moore was fucking interesting. Well, yeah, I yes. mean, he was a weirdo, a batshit crazy weirdo, right? Batshit crazy yeah. like wizard weirdo. Yes, it's true. But yes, so this is the introduction to every episode of the cartoon that you could find on HBO Max. It's actually it's much better than the movie. Yes, much. Yeah. The cartoon okay. aspects are actually really entertaining. Yeah. As Troy pointed out, the Violator's done much better. Yes. Um, and Keith fucking David does the yes. voice of Spawn. <laughs> no, and, and you could tell that that was the beginning of Keith Keith David's voice acting career. Yes. Because yeah. the first season of the, the, the cartoon or the animated bit, he's rough. Yeah. Yeah. And so is the animation. Yeah. Yeah. And you get to season two where they were given a budget. Yeah. And... I it, I think that Keith David went off and had some lessons about how to how to voice act because the second season is just not even comparable to the first. Oh yeah, as far as style and and feel. Yeah, which I've watched it. Uh, Jen hasn't. Uh, she just watched the first uh, season, but you can see the nuggets of how it would become yes. much better. Yeah. Um, yeah. With there was just... nothing that was like, oh, we're just going to change it. It was like we right. made it better. No, it's like the the opposite of the the X Men cartoon where the last season was rough. Yes, and then the all the other seasons are great. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, because also the the is it by the third season they get way more into Angela and the whole yeah they introduce her in the first season they did because she has the spawn earrings and her forehead is, is gigantic like, is enormous yeah. yeah yeah she looked like she walked off of uh, something around the same period the head. That was on, like, actually my thought was, oh, it's Hammerhead from uh, the animated <laughs> yeah. Spider Man. Good, good to see that he's getting work. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so um, first time watching it, Jen, what did you think of the the cartoon? Well, I mean, I had a good laugh at the beginning. Yes. Um, how can you not like listening to Keith David narrate something for? Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's yeah, the cartoon is a <laughs> yeah. lot more noir yeah. almost in oh, yes. its yeah, yeah. presentation. Well, and I felt like, you know, I agree that there were a lot of aspects of the cartoon that were kind of refined and done better than the comic. Yes. Um, like the the uh, homeless cadre in the alley, I thought was done much better in the um, cartoon. They're actual characters with yes. actual names. Right, yeah. and stories. <laughs> the thing that I was like, the disconnect that I had was the, the like guide for spawn that's in the cagliostro yeah that's yeah. in the uh the the co- cartoon that's not in the comic does that does he show up later yes. okay he does show okay. up in the comic yeah and he's he, is he a i'm trying to remember is he a former hell spawn yes uh i i, I did formed one or it's kind of like the uh it's kind of like in ghost rider where okay. you have the the sam yeah not Sam Neill. <laughs> Sam <laughs> Elliott. Sam Elliott. <laughs> I mean, the, the comic has, has gone out of its way even before they started introducing offshoots of here's this spawn, here's this spawn. There have right. been many hell spawn. Yeah. Usually there's like a couple hundred years in between each one. But uh, even when, like, uh, in, the, uh, in the comic when they introduced Angela, they were talking about how she had killed the hell spawn from 500 years ago. Right. And then and, she wanted to crack at this. And she one. wanted to crack at the new one. Uh, interestingly enough, while we're talking about Angela, uh, one of the only Image Comics uh, creations to move over to the Marvel universe. 
Interesting. She is a guardian of the galaxy now. <laughs> really? Yeah. Well, while we're talking about women, I wanted to touch on... Um, she was one of the only real characters with agency. Female characters with agency. Um, other Wanda kind of has some... But it feels Except like, in the movie, Jesus yeah. Christ. Oh, she was just there in the movie. Yeah, so in the comic and in the cartoon, most of the women that are portrayed are victims. Mm. They're either being sexually assaulted or they're being, you know, demeaned um, or... Yes. You know, it's... And there aren't very many of them. The cartoon had more women. The comic, there were like four. Oh, yeah. And one of them was the more. talking head... Yes. Uh, and the newscaster. Yeah. yeah. And it was just like, wow, there are no women in this city, except for when someone needs to get raped. And and I will state that having touched base and kept up with the, the, the Spawn universe, just more out of curiosity of, are they going to answer the questions I've had with the characters <laughs> since it was first introduced? By the way, are they? Uh, they are, but they're disappointing. <laughs> ah, they're and... incredibly disappointing. Okay. To me, to me, it doesn't right. mean like anyone yeah. ever right. going to be. But to me, it, there there is a common theme of every, at least from what I've read and the synopsis I was reading was every main female character that gets introduced that has some kind of power, some kind of agency, is then turned into, and then they were taken over by insert whatever thing here, mm-hmm. and Spawn had to save them. Mm-hmm. I have heard several uh, people mention, and keep in mind my. I have no dog in this fight. I was never a huge Spawn person or a huge Witchblade person, but I basically have heard from fans of both that Angela and people in Spawn uh, were kind of a catalyst for Witchblade because it was yes. a response to Spawn. Yes. Um, and wasn't that was that image as well? No. No. Uh, Top Cow. Top Cow. Yeah. Top Cow was uh, Witchblade. Yeah, and I didn't get involved until the Darkness showed up later. Um, yes. And I was a big fan of the Darkness. Yes. Um, but again, you have that whole, you know, forces of creation kind of heaven and hell ish kind of thing. So, because yeah, it's and someday we will do the Witchblade episode where we oh, dig man. up the old mm. TV series. <laughs> That'll be entertaining. Don't don't watch the Japanese uh, animated <laughs> version of that. Oh yeah, no, probably not. Because no. yeah, <laughs> but uh, the. The thing that I liked about the introduction of Angela into the comic, and she was done in the first six episodes, just like she was in the first season of the of the, of the uh, animated series, is she's an introduction of a character, like you said, that has agency. Mm-hmm. And you, she doesn't lose agency, agency right. until later. Mm-hmm. Um, but she's a strong character. She very much has her own motivations. She's strong. She's motivated. She has killed Hellspawn in the past. And she is trapped in the bureaucracy that is heaven. Mm-hmm. Which I will also give McFarlane credit for. Why hasn't Heaven gotten involved in all the horrible things? Because they're trapped in bureaucracy. Right. right. Oh, and that leads me to all of the conspiracy yes. theories and stuff going on. Um, I also want to touch on, again, not a spoiler for the comics, but there were, I found there were some really subtle Watchmen references. Yes, yes. Um, in the comic. Um, which also speaks to conspiracy theories. Right. Well, um, but I mean, in in the in the comic, there were conspiracy theories about the government, about yes. mafia. Like the mafia is only Italian, and it's based in Rome, which strongly indicates that the Vatican is in charge of the mafia. They never come out and say it, but yes. they get yeah. damn close. Yeah, the police and society in general. Yep. But uh, yeah, it was. The, the Watchmen references, I was just like, wait a minute. I also love the fact that all the Watchmen references typically came from Sam Burke and Twitch. Yes. The cops. Which I'm glad that you brought them up because Sam and Twitch, um, you can already see it in the first six issues. Uh, and you see it in the in the first season of the animated. Yes. Sam and Twitch go on to become major characters. They get their own comics. They, get, they are... Um, the un the unlikely spinoff kind of of the Spawn universe. Yes, and I love seeing them whenever they're on screen. Is like it supposed to be like his version of like Rosencrantz and Guildenstern or it's something. It's um, Bullock and uh, Montoya from from Batman, Batman no, series. Okay. Yes, yeah. yeah. that equivalent. Yes, um, but really stretched because like 
Montoya never bows to uh, to, uh, to Bullock. Bullock like Twitch does to Sam. Well, it is. It even like is. I don't even view it as bowing to. It's they've been around each other for so long. They just know the ebbs and flows of their personalities, and they just work incredibly well together. Yeah, uh, fantastic characters, especially if you get further uh, into kind of their exploits, because yes, they become kind of the connecting tissue throughout all of Image. So they show up in, like, Savage Dragon. They show up in Youngbloods. Yep. They show up all over the place. Like, the two demons that keep popping back and forth between, like, Swamp Thing and, and Constantine. Or and... the three old guys in Cowboy Bebop. Yeah. yeah. It, no. yeah. <laughs> no, Son because, of a bitch! Because they don't show up in other animes. That's true. No. But, I mean, they, they are they are the, the two <clears throat> point-of-view characters that you can follow and, and identify with as they go through all these things with all these individuals with superpowers. Right. Like, I mean, I'm not going to spoil the future or thing, but they become very pivotal in plots down the road. Like, the fact that yeah. they know who Spawn is, they know what he does, they become more brought into that world and aware of it and are more able to operate around it and tap into the, the connections they've made to make things happen. Right. There are a lot of... Um... A lot of uh, parallels yes. uh, between both in DC and Marvel. You have a lot of characters that were like, we studied you so much that we figured out who you were. Or we, you know, we got in uh, the second Robin or third Robin? Uh, it was Tim that actually studied Tim, Batman Tim, Tim, enough. Tim, yeah. Tim Drake was the one that knew who Batman was. Right. He figured it out. Jason Todd was the one that took the oh, wheels right. off the Batmobile. Yes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, you know, but a lot of examples of that, of the the people who are so good at doing what they do that eventually they, they have no choice but to either be killed off or become a pivotal part of what's going yes. on. And, and with the characters, you get to see it a lot more in the animated series because you get to see Twitch sitting there listening to 40 hours of, of surveillance tapes to find that one piece of information they need. He's the, you know, the grunt work. The, yeah. I, I can find the details. I can dig through the files and find this all this information. Burke is the practical approach to it. He knows how to yeah. organize the unit, how to make things happen. And, and I love the fact that neither one of them is like shoving it in the other's face about that. Mm -hmm. They just, like I said, they work so well together. Twitch knows he gets the information to Burke. Burke's going to act on it. Yeah. And act in the way that makes the most sense that will benefit the most people. It's not like by, I give it to the blowhard and off he goes. Yeah, by the book, like he says. Well, yeah, most of the time. But, but you have to you have to come to that realization that, that's, that they are working together because they seem so contentious. Yes. You know, when you're first introduced to them, you're like, oh, Twitch is just like this guy's grunt. Like, you know, they don't, they're not a, they're, it's not a partnership. But you really, you know, like as you get to know them as a team, you learn yes. that it actually it is It takes a, partnership. Yeah. a long time in the comic to get to that point. And that's, I'm glad the animated series was able to develop that in the first season. So you immediately, you're, you're, you're seeing a lot of it from, they're the ones finding the stuff. They're the people right. not involved that, they have to go in and try and piece it together. And so they're kind of your, the world point of view uh, perspective for the viewer. Also, they, they do, as you were saying, uh, kind of just subconsciously or consciously um, acquiesce to the other strengths. So, yes. like, there is a point where the, the chief of police basically pulls them off the case mm -hmm. and sets his own task force up. And Twitch's response is, okay, well, that's... That is that. And and Sam is like, oh no. No, no, no. This is how we're going to, you know, go through while still following the rules. Yes. But we're going to get basically back into the investigation. Yes, it, it's two, it, two friends work. hanging out. Yeah. But off work hours. Off work hours that was in a Twitch. car. That was Twitch in the comic. You're Twitch right. Twitch was the one who was You're like, right. well, I have this new hobby. But it's hanging what, out in a car after right. at midnight in this particular You're neighborhood. Right. You want to, with yeah. my buddy, we're doing manly things yeah. together. For me, it was it was Just a little confusing guys, in the way in the way the, the the speech bubbles were placed as to know which one it was. 
I mean, one of the responses is, you know, you know, in response to it saying, hey, Twitch, da 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 in response to it, but it was delivered in the mannerism that Burke tended to have. But yeah. I could see either character going, we're just going to hang out outside of work and completely toe the line on the... Well, I, I knew it was Twitch because Twitch has always talked about being a family man and having a wife and yes. kids, and he said the seven wife's going to be pissed. You're right. Yeah, you're right, you're right. And um, also then said he had seven children. Yes. I was like, holy shit, dude. <laughs> there Twitch are... is a fuck machine. There's, there's a reason why he's called Twitch. <laughs> the machine. The machine. Well... <laughs> Just to give people that might read the comic, you do get to find out why he's called Twitch if you keep reading the comic. Okay. And oh, good. There's, okay. there's depth Is it to worth it? it? Yes. I will just say that Twitch has a skill set we have not seen at this point in the comic yet. Cool. That cool. makes him very important later. So, um... The comic. Let's, let's get to that. So, Troy, it's been a while since you read it. Um, yes. I'm going to go to Bear and Jen uh, first, because it's the first time you've read the comic, yep. both of you. Yep. Um, what'd you think? I I enjoyed it um, after, because I had already just watched the movie <laughs> and, oh, the, man. and the series, oh, my God. and it was like it was like a relief. <laughs> a palate cleanser. Right? Yep. It was just like, it was like kind of like I went to like an Iron Chef competition, and I watched everybody make the same dish, and... And then I was just like, and then the actual Iron Chef made the dish. <laughs> and I was just like, oh, well, thank God. <laughs> that he invented. Yeah. Yeah. Jen? Yeah, same. I, I um, read the comic coming off of watching the, the cartoon. Um, and, you know, if I had to rank them, I actually was surprised that I liked the comic as much as I did. And I would have to say, ranking them, the comic is at the top. I like the cartoon, and I, there, there are things about the comic I didn't like that the cartoon fixed, and vice versa. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, exactly. Um, and the movie is way, way <laughs> at the bottom. Yeah. But the the comic uh, was a pleasant surprise. I, I, you know, was after listening to Todd McFarlane <sighs> stroke himself for. <laughs> okay. By the way, I did. I was. I told uh, our friend three. That that I was doing yeah. uh, this, and he said that he loved Todd McFarlane and referred to him as the Todd Father. Yes. Yeah, I've heard that. So, yeah, he mentioned that when I was uh, hanging out yeah. earlier before I came over here. And I mean, you know what? Frankly, <laughs> I, I'm not I'm not gonna harsh on anyone that likes things that no. I don't like. Everybody likes what they like. <laughs> Except so. for the fact that we just harshed on. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not gonna harsh on the fact that other people like it. Okay. That's fine. They right. can like it. There are things that I like that people don't like. So right. and also that I appreciate and understand the contribution Todd McFarlane has made Absolutely. to the comic industry and the the movie industry as well as, you know, being one of those first people that had a movie based off a comic mm -hmm. that they tried to mm -hmm. transition over to the silver screen. But I mean, Todd McFarlane's the three. yeah, <laughs> Todd McFarlane's ego is enormous. Yes. yes, and I can separate that from the creative right. genius behind some of the stuff. I mean, if we hadn't if we hadn't had Image Comics, I don't think we'd have the Marvel Cinematic Universe as we know it. Yeah, because True. we wouldn't have had people try and break out into the Ultimates, right. which right. was basically the the more grounded version that they then kind of used as the. The, the basis for the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Jessica Jones and the launch of the Correct. Max title uh, in, in Marvel. You yes. know, a lot of that stuff was was because we had these grittier, grittier artists that were taking uh, publisher jobs, you know, at the big two, at yes. Marvel and DC, and you could see the hints of what they were trying to do, but obviously the editors were like, this is a kid's book. Right. And I think part of the big thing that, that I, they attribute to Todd and, and the guys that went on to make Image was the fact that they were creators that wanted to own their creations. Right. And the big two, DC and Marvel, were like, nope. If you write it for us, it's ours. Even right. if we say, go create something new, we own it. You have no part in it. Right. And, you know, they didn't have the opportunities that like Stan Lee and those did those guys did when and Jack Kirby when they started in the comic industry it was like nope it's established the it, the the studio owns it you have no part in it you get no cut of it just do your job right. yep and image was basically a way for them to go 
we're taking that back. Right. And I think that that's really important, even outside of the comics industry. Yes. You know, it's any artist, anyone, any creative, to be able to to retain rights to your work, to the thing that you have made. You know, it's like, I, I think mm-hmm. that there's a real difference between people who are have the ability to retain even the s- smallest amount of rights and what they put forth as opposed to being part of, you know, a quote unquote factory yes. of, of work, you know, where they are a cog in a machine and they come in and they do their bit and they leave. And, you know, the, the only credit that's given is to the machine that made, made that whatever. Right. Yep. Absolutely agreed. Uh, yeah. And I'm, in, I'm in the same boat having, uh, I mean, I've read this before because you could not be a comic book fan in the late nineties without having a dollar issue of the first issue of spawn, like offered to you every time you walk into a comic book store, uh, uh, you couldn't go to a garage sale without, Hey, hey, hey buddy. Yeah. You want, you want some spawn? You want some spawn Spawn for a dollar? Oh, and the sheer number of reprints they've done. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, you had the cartoon, you had all of this stuff, especially around 97 when they had a media blitz campaign. Well, I'm just talking about, like, the re-releases of the TPBs under various collections. Oh, yeah. I yeah. don't think I know of any other publisher that's cranked out so many different versions of the same comic. So this season we've done a lot more digital, um, but I literally walked into a store yesterday and had the Origins Collection Volume 1, which is exactly what we're reading here. For ten dollars. Yep. And I'm like, oh, well, it's ten dollars. <laughs> hey, buddy, you want some some spawn? That's right. Well, it's exactly that, what it was. It's only a dollar for spawn. And that's a new reprint, right? Um, that was this reprint. Well, it's under the Tog McFarlane Productions line, so yeah, it's probably. Yeah. Um, I, I tried to go back when when you had brought this 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 podcast 2019. up. Twenty nineteen. For spawn, I had to go back and go. Okay. Which collection do I want to right. get my hands on? Because there's been really questionable quality ones that have been put out when Todd was first starting to try and I need some TPBs so that people can catch up on Spawn. And I need omnibuses. I yeah. need, yeah. It's Wikipedia is great. If you just look up Spawn, <laughs> Wikipedia, it'll tell you the, um, the, the collections. It'll tell you what the most recent ones are. That's where I ended up going. Did the Todd father write that too? No. <laughs> highly not. I, I'm guessing it's all the people who, like me, were like, oh God, which, which is the most recent collection? Mm-hmm. Because some of them have the crossovers brought in so that you can have context. Because like Cerberus, who was another comic character at the time, had a crossover with Spawn. Right. And the comic refers to it later. And if you haven't read it, you're like, what the hell? Yeah. I can't speak for the further uh, issues in the in the collection, but I will recommend the Origins Collection, uh, Volume 1, because it just, the way that they've put it in, it's actually got, like, vibrant, the original vibrant artwork. Yes. And, and things like that. Yeah, and so. speaking of artwork, there was something you were just flipping through that book, and it reminded me. There were the the, the way that McFarland draws demons reminds me a lot of the art that came from Sandman. Oh, McKeon's art. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm, I mean, McKeon. They're got, contemporaries. Yeah, so. they, yeah, McKeon. I feel got a lot more nuanced and actually did a lot of really beautiful things, and and McFarland excellent artist but still was very um focused in a different direction yes. right yes um I, I would i would say that mckeon mckeon's attention to softer edges yeah. makes his demons um you know a little a little more relatable whereas mcfarlane is looking to make these sharp angles to make you just think right. they're, 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 all, have, they're all like possible. Yeah. they're all like long thin <clears throat> arms and legs pot bellies yes with lots of teeth yeah yep. like that's this that's the like 90s demon yep. yeah <laughs> so uh any other thoughts before we go to our last question yeah i just had one actually go for it uh i kind of feel like Spawn and Todd McFarlane are kind of like Limp Biscuit and Fred Durst. Oh, huh? Yeah. Love Limp Biscuit. 
Hey, Fred Durst. They just want to break stuff? Yeah. I mean, I I feel one of the other topics that has to be brought up when and we've kind of touched upon it with with the, the three mediums, the comics, the the the, the animated series and, and the movie is Terry and Wanda. Yeah. Because in the animated series, Terry and Wanda, I believe you and, you and I, Josh, were talking about this through text a little bit over the last 24 hours, is in the animated series, they are the, the, the typical definition I like that I would say are fuck around and find out. Yes. Mm. They are digging into shit that anyone now would go, are you insane? Right, the government and the mafia is involved in this. Oh, let's keep. I digging. gotta keep digging. Oh, a private investigator used to be a cop who's basically saying, "I'm not going to give you this information until you tell me that you're not going to keep digging into it because this will get basically all but says this will get you killed." killed. Right. Yes, hands it to her, and she goes, "Hey, you know, little kids don't come back from the dead." I'm like, "That's great, but you have a family." Yeah, you have a little kid. You have a little kid, and these people have proven that they will go after kill kids. And you're going to keep digging on it. Yeah, well, and I, f- I felt like um, the there was a twist with the senator and the senator's bastard child. Yes. Between the, the animated series and the, and the comic. Yes, and they I did it think, differently. I think in the animated series, that worked better. Yes, I, I, will, I will give the entire Billy Kincaid arc in the animated series way more credit than the comic one. The comic one was just kind of a a flash in the pan and it was done. Yeah. I gotta ask, in the 80s and 90s, how many secret bastard serial killer children of senators were there? Because it seems like there were a lot. I mean, in the Image Universe, there were, like, every senator must have had at least two or three of them. Well, you know, it's it's uh, it's an old theme, babe. Yeah, it's it's an old trope. (laughs) It's a really, really old theme. Um, But... Yeah, the '90s were like, let's talk about this. Let's let's flap. Let's put it on the table and talk about this. Um, yeah. But I mean, you know, Wanda doing that, and then Terry works as a accountant at the the military munitions mm-hmm. company. Right. Finds that there's some discrepancies in the logs. Great. Not nothing wrong with finding that. Takes it to not his boss, but the head of the company. Who, and the head of the company's first question is, who else have you shown this to? And then, doesn't that doesn't trigger any... Mm. Right. Any, da- I'm in danger alerts. Right. Or, this is the bad guy. Yeah. It's like, and then keeps digging. I'm like, you know what? I, I love the fact that in the anime series, Wynn was like, explaining to, to, to Chapel when, you know, why are you letting him live well, after he brought the report in? It's like, he's loyal. He's loyal and... He has the company's best interests in mind. Right. I'm like... That's fine. That means that yeah. you understand it. You can control him. You're not worried about it. Right. And then they kind of reach a point where he hacks into the system to find it mm-hmm. right. at night. Right. And again, you work in a government facility. How do you not suspect that they could find you for this? Right. Right. Well, and it's kind of like, yeah, it, it reminds me a lot of uh, political operatives and how. Um, if you're starting a campaign, the first thing you do is hire someone to get all the dirt on your yeah. candidate. The reason being, if they can find it, somebody else can find it. So that's smart. That was a, yes. That was win basically being, I, we I may thought, have to eliminate this loose thread eventually, but in the meantime, he's going to find everything that somebody else might find. Yeah, he's basically going to find all the dirt we need to sweep under the rug, right. and then we can figure out what to do with him once we reach that point. Right. He'll do the work for us thinking he's doing the right thing, And all he's doing is helping us bury it deeper. Right. Which, uh, credit where credit is due, that is some nuance. Oh, yeah. That was not around, really, in the 90s, because the the assumption was people were too stupid to understand it. And that, because it was in the animated series, had the benefit of time to go back and think about Mm -hmm. it. Yeah. And go, what's a better way to do it? And again, with all that was going on, where you were interweaving the, the Wanda and Terry stuff with Billy Kincaid stuff, and behind a good chunk of this is Violator. Yeah. Which is, you don't get that subtle manipulation out of him in the comics until right. way down the road. Okay. But, I mean, it, and I think that's probably why we saw it in the animated series, because when the, it came out, 
the comic had gotten to that point, and they're like, yeah. we need to establish this earlier, that yeah. he can actually manipulate things. And the other difference in the animated and the comic is that in the animated, Violator is an active player on the field. Right. He is... He is a trusted agent of Malvolja, and he is yeah. forwarding that agenda. And even in the movie, he's doing that. Right. But in the comic, he's just a guy that was sent to go keep tabs on Spawn. Well, right. and he wants with. Spawn's position. Right. Right. He, he wants, wants Spawn to fail. In the, in the comic. Yes. Yeah. In the comic. In the, comic. In the, comic. In the yeah. animated series, you got the feeling like he was sent there to be a mentor to Spawn. But he was just yes. not doing a very good and job. And even in the comic, when Malvolja makes his appearance when the yeah. two are throwing down with each other right. to stop his petty children. Right. He pretty much tells Violator, you're supposed to get him ready. Right. right. You're supposed to be the mentor. Right. And But you don't, yeah, I mean, it's more like children squabbling in the right. comic. In the animated series, you do see that he has, a, Violator has that skill set to actually, in Malvoja's eyes, mentor spawn right but and I, I think he has it in the comic we just because it was so todd was trying to get so much out in the comic yeah. yeah in so many in so few issues to establish that hook to get people to want to come back he had to world build and all the other stuff in the movie in the animated series he has he could just exposition through keith david or yeah. cagliostro going yeah, right yeah. here's the world here you go yeah i mean you even go. even looking through this i mean one of the the gripes that i had about the comic it's there is wall of text in every page, it but that's again me. because Todd's trying to explain he's world so building. much shit all at the same time. Whereas in the cartoon, you have six episodes that are half an hour each. Yep, you know, so you have three hours basically to to show things in different ways, but you can do ten seconds here. You can do yep. you know a lot of the stuff, especially like you were saying, Jen, that that happens with the, the alley and the homeless people mm -hmm. and the, yep. the relationship there. Yep. I know that that gets developed later in the comic. Yes. In the first six issues, you're still basically in the second episode where Al's like, I don't give a shit about any of you. Go fuck yourselves. Right. I you mean know? the the relationship with the homeless people in the alley is established through the the I'm gonna forget the guy's name. The character that he oh befriends. the first bum yeah uh, yeah I can't remember his anyway name. Is it Garrett I mean or ba Jack basically or? you know I think it's Jack he's, Jack exactly. yeah so they you know like he's Spawn is like mar 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 why do you care whatever and he's like because you're in the same situation that we are right you know you may have abilities that I don't have but you know you're here with us he right was, that he was, means he was you that are, anchor to reality yeah yes you are part of our community because mm -hmm. you choose to stay here yep. well and the thing that i noticed in this watch that i never noticed before is he chips away at spawn yes yes and it's not like you know there are reactions and again keith david and his portrayal like in his voice even though he has that Keith David voice that you think it's always going to be the same, by the time the man shows up and is talking with him and says, I've got a half a loaf of bread, I'm happy to share it with you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a hesitation that he ha that Spawn has before he's like, go away. Like, yes. but it's, it's so subtle, it's really good, yeah. and it's not something, again, that... It's hard I to think that I have seen in yeah. print. Yes. It's hard to portray in print. It's it it's hard also to portray in, in when your voice is the only thing. Yes. Yeah. And you're depending on animators to kinda yeah. And know, that's why I'm through. saying like since that happened later or was it is it was it second season when that comes up or was it, it was either at the end of first or the beginning of second when that scene that you were talking about the It's first play, season. It's first. We only we and, only watched first season. Yeah, and I think the fact is that I know that Spawn was one of first one of Keith David's first real voice acting roles, and I think from when you when you when he first starts in it, it's rough. Yeah, it's rough. But I mean, the whole concept of Spawn is rough at that point. But yeah, you can see the development of of Al Simmons through Keith David's voice. He becomes a three dimensional character. Right. Those pauses, the, the the change in inflections. I completely agree, and I think that it happens earlier than you than you think. It could be, and I I, I think that it does happen early in the first because I haven't seen the second season, and I really I do agree with you in the first couple of episodes. It is Keith David reading the script. Yes, yes, 
But, and, and again... You know, he's reading, it's like a table read, you know? He's yeah. like, I'm going to put a little inflection in this. It's not just going to be me reading it. But then I think he realizes as the series goes on that he can't portray, like, he can't have a, a you know, show emotion on his face because his face isn't being yep. shown. Right. He has to really use his voice to do that. I think so. it was when he transitioned from, I've been in movies, to... Yeah. I'm a voice actor. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, and even, you know, looking at the progression of his voice acting career, I mean, one of the best examples I can think of that I'm going to bring Jen full circle is he was in Saints Row 4. Yeah. Yeah. And he, as himself. And, but yeah. he has some <laughs> amazing nuances at that point that you can see the rough side of that mm -hmm. in the Spawn cartoon yeah. uh, of him just kind of realizing that. I am known for my... He's known for his voice. Oh, yes. Like, right. he can oh, yes. Yes. You know, Samuel Jackson's is known for his voice. Morgan Freeman's known for his voice. Fucking, uh, you know, uh, Keith David, known yeah. for that. Yeah. Like, yep. Uh, actually, yeah. one of my favorite parts of most WWE documentaries is that they have him on retainer to be oh, the voice me. for a lot of those. Right. Yep. And that's as soon as it starts, you're like, ah, it's Keith David. I am ready for this. You know, yep. I have a trusted right. friend. That's I am me glad through. that you said it that way because there there are going to be a small segment of our audience that will get this, but it's Keith David mm -hmm. high on this mountain. The next mountain over is Barry White. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And if you know what I'm talking about, you know what I'm talking about. Because yep. yeah. <laughs> you're ready to fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Gee, oh. thanks for being so obvious there, babe. You got it. Thanks for not being very white <laughs> right there. Uh, Troy, one of the other things before I close it out that you were talking about before we started recording that I wanted to make sure to get back to yes. is Gen X and Spawn. Yes. Um, because I do believe that this is a very late Gen X you know, we have we have multiple. You know, we have the spectrum of Gen, of Gen X. X here. <laughs> yes, we do. Uh, you know, I I'm literally the last. It's seventy nine. I'm literally the last year you could be born and be yep. Gen X. Um, you know, and then we have Gen, who's pretender. The beginning of that spectrum. You're a pretender. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm the Oregon Trail generation. <laughs> uh, but I mean, it, the points that you brought up, I, I wanted to make sure to cede the floor sure, to you because. Sure. Damn, the, like it was a really good point that I hadn't thought and, about. And, and part of it came up was as as I was watching the animated series, my wife was there, and my wife is 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 a, is the next gen. So her takes on the the animated series and such were different than mine. And so we had a discussion, and that brought up the whole idea of the fact that the the timing of Image and McFarlane and with, with Spawn and everything else was in a point where the generations, the only experience with war that any of us had was the Vietnam War had happened and our parents talked about it. It was one of the things you don't talk about. It, it, not in not, school. Not in school. It doesn't yeah. it doesn't come up in school and usually your parents didn't want to talk about it if they had been in the war. Like my right. father does not talk about it. But right. But it was a all we really got exposed to was the books. We didn't have a Ken Burns yet to to right. show us what war really is. So for us it was just the we had like some like fictional novels and such. We had and then you have this gap. We had where, apocalypse now. Right, right. We, have, <laughs> we understood that very, very bad things happened. Yes. And a lot of people believed we never should have been there in the first place. Yeah. And eventually, it, depending on your age and depending on, on what you were exposed to, you may have known that when the soldiers came back, they were not appreciated. Correct. Yeah. Um, those are the like three main bullet points that you kind of knew about the Vietnam yep. War. And then you'd be like, but you mean MASH? And they were like, no, that was the Korean War. Yeah. Don't we? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Don't Korean War, we'll talk about that's two. fine. Right. Yeah. But, but the whole idea that you had this generation of, of people who didn't really have to experience living with war firsthand. Mm -hmm. And so it was, we watched movies. It was glorified to us, but we had nothing to really explore it with. And I, and I even brought up the idea of, you know, a lot of RPGs, D&D &D came about in that time period was brought forth and you look at it now versus then where it was back then it was the how quickly can I kill in the, the shortest amount of time. Right. And it's changed to something else now. It's, it's, it's more roleplay. But also you only get XP if you kill something. Correct. You have to kill right. something to, do, to, to advance. You have to kill something and, or you have to steal something or you have to... Yeah, but, well, but steal something you get an item. 
There was no XP for stealing shit in D and D. Correct. Well, the there beginning. was by the time you get to, not in first edition, by the time you get in the second edition. But, right. but just to watch it, the progression yeah. of it, it started with the it's just mechanical. It's just you get this, you do these things, you get rewarded. Right. If they'll ever get a pill, but um, the the idea is that DC and and Marvel were just we're just telling the same old stories. Mm-hmm. We're just rehashing it. It's like now it's this artist's t- turn and this writer's turn to tell those stories. You know. Riddler and all that. Nothing was new. It was all just rehash it, re, re, recast it, throw it back out there. In some cases, sanitize it. Right, and sanitize it. And like, or if you wanted to watch X Men or read X Men, it's like it's soap opera time. Who, who, who's right. with who this week? So, Image with McFarlane, you know, breaking off and doing this, it was a chance for the whole Gen X to go. This is something that's for me. I am the target audience of this, and it is aimed at me, and it's allowing me to explore things that I haven't been able to. Right. It's like, let's talk about the you know the, the grittier heroes. It's like, well, we didn't get to see that because no one wants to talk about the Vietnam War, and all we know about the Korean War is MASH. Right. So it's like, what's it like? What is this? And it's it's a chance for the Gen Xers to express that of trying to take their take on what. What would people go through in these, these situations? Well, and I think it also was because Gen Xers, we lived through the Cold War. Yes. So we didn't, you know, the the generations before were all about their government. Like, mm-hmm. their government was the thing. You know, you were, you were patriotic. You were right. loyal to your government. Yep. And then we yeah. went through the Cold War, Company men, which, you had which yeah, yeah but like the head. Cold War taught us that yeah, okay, we don't have like a war with people shooting each other in a on a battlefield with guns and there aren't bombs and whatever in a battlefield. We've got people doing things in secret. We have governments doing things in secret. Right. That we trust are for our benefit. Right. Right. Do we really trust them? And that's where that yeah. question started to come up, exactly. and that's what yeah. Image and all those like Spawn started to ask the question of, especially with all these conspiracies, because the Cold War gave birth to the. There's all this stuff going on that you don't know. The late '80s, early '90s, when all that stuff started to kind of come out, yeah. the Iran Contras and all that stuff, and we started to understand that there was a lot more to the government than we had been led to believe. Right. Right. But we had no way to really explore it because there were so many laws about you can't talk about this. Mm-hmm. Right. So the only outlet for a lot of that was. Through comics and things that the government's like, eh, whatever. It's it's a cartoon, right? Yeah, well, it's yeah. a movie or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And, well, and but part of that was also they they heavily relied on the comic books uh, code. Yes, yes, to, they to do the heavy lifting. And Image said, "Fuck the comic books code. <laughs> We're out. We're not going to do that." Yeah. Well, and I find it also. What is the comic books code? Um. So when McCarthyism happened, mm-hmm. uh, they they brought in comic book creators and basically said. You're corrupting children's minds with not just socialist ideas, but like all these other ideas. Anti government so, ideas. Yeah, that's when. Uh, the liberal the, ideas. Yep. Yeah, that's when there was. A, I guess we've never talked about the comic no, book on the show. No. Um, and all from Spawn. And there was. Yeah, well, and there was all this shit that they said you couldn't have anymore. So you couldn't have. You couldn't use the word vampire. Uh, yeah. You know, there's a bunch of these arbitrary rules that were super weird. Um, and I imagine if we, you know, when the Mobius movie comes out, when we do the uh, Mobius show, we'll talk a mo- more about that because Mobius was created. No, Mobius. Mobius, the okay. living vampire. Oh, I thought it was Morpheus, but okay. Okay. <laughs> no, he's, it's Mobius. he's he gives you pills. I know this. He gives you pills. <laughs> Mor- uh, <laughs> Morpheus make you sleep. But uh, he, uh, they no, basically, no. he was not originally the living vampire because you right. can say he was a vampire. Gotcha. So they made a fablot. Uh, Phlebotomist. Phlebotomist. There you go. Yes. That was doing blood work and things like that, that an experiment went wrong. And now he's got and, a, a and virus. And he has a virus. And yep. so, but they never said vampire up until the comics book, comic book code was basically dropped in its entirety. And then they started calling him the living vampire. Um, but, yeah, fascinating topic that... I'm going to save until Mobius, because Mobius has a lot more to do with it yeah. than uh, than Spider-Man does. I would say we could do an entire episode on that. Yeah, on the comic book code? Yeah. Yes. Sure. We might have I mean, I, that I, might I, be I, a, bo- a good bonus episode. Go. I didn't even know it existed. So. Oh, yeah. No, yeah. directly out of McCarthyism. There were a lot of comic book writers that were blackballed, or yep. uh, yeah. blacklisted. Blacklisted. 
um, due to what they had put in comic books. Uh, there's a there's a whole actually if we ever do a Tales from the Crypt episode also there's an entire point from McCarthyism to like the 80s where you couldn't make horror comics mm-hmm. or if you yeah. did it had to be very subtle ways and then in the 80s uh, once the pushback started on the comic book code like people started publishing them but they were like super like Scooby Doo episodes basically. Mm-hmm. And then it's you just don't see mask. right, yeah. and then you don't see serious horror comics until the comic book code is dropped in the in the nineties. Um, super interesting, yeah. That would be a really fun uh, yeah. episode to do. Wow. But we can thank McFarlane and people like him that yeah. basically got us out from underneath that. Thing well, that just, that just oppressed a lot of creative. Sure. Talent. Right. Okay, so I actually have a better opinion of Todd McFarlane right now. Thank you, three. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I respect the man for what he did. Yep. Yeah. He's we just, would not be here if, if it wasn't for his efforts. But you don't have efforts. to be a jerk about it. Right. <laughs> you don't yeah, gotta get all full of your conversation stuff. of, you know, love the art, not so keen on the artist. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we've discussed it several times. Yeah. My absolute favorite Superman comic is American Alien by Max Landis. Max Landis is, uh, not, is not a great dude. Nope. Um, you know, I love, I still show his wrestling isn't wrestling. Yep. It's, uh, it's a good one. It's he's, great. He is a brilliant creative mind, but he's but a also, horrible human being. He's a horrible human being. Right. And you can, the, the two can exist. Yeah. You know? We got Warren Ellis. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we've discussed Warren Ellis actually on our, on our, uh, you know, but Warren Ellis's last episode. It, it, contents are displayed on the yes. tin. Yeah, yes. We, we were talking <laughs> about that. Basically, you read anything by Warren Ellis, you look at anything in his interviews, he basically is like, I am a fuckhead. Yes. Yeah. I am Spider Jerusalem. It. You trust the fuckhead. Yes. You yeah. know? Yeah. Yeah, uh, right. we, just, we just did, on Rat Conversations, we just did Transmetropolitan, the first trip. Yes. And that, we discussed that where I'm like, listen, we're going to talk about Warren Ellis because it's impossible to separate him from probably one of his best known works yes but a lot of people are like well he was grooming and he was doing this i'm like i'm sure he said publicly you know <laughs> like, yeah no and, he, and warren ellis is one of my my favorite yes. comic authors has done so many great things but you know but you yes, just know you, yeah. you when you yeah. when you when you approach one of his titles you're like this is warren ellis there's yeah. certain expectations that you are going to have to do absolutely understand are coming oh well and when when reports come out and it's like you know He's dating this 18-year-old that he's known since she was 15, and he's been in communication, and that's yeah. grooming. And you're like, yep, mm-hmm. that's Warren Ellis. Yeah. I mean... it's It doesn't make yeah. the, the behavior... It doesn't acceptable. excuse it. Right. Or make it ex- acceptable. It's, just, it's the thing, you know, and, and I definitely am not saying that that person should have protections because he is known to be this person. Uh, yeah, I, I think that it's just people yeah. who, who you know, are like, he needs to be canceled, what have you. I, I just, I'm like, he, he he is this way. Hide right. your women, hide your children. Right. Whereas, whereas <laughs> Ain't if you're Ain't nobody got time for this. Right. Whereas if you're a Bill Cosby. Yeah. That's like trying to be like, I have this pure, yeah. you know, I'm no. I'm a good guy. Yeah, no, yeah. no. 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 Yeah, that makes you more monstrous. Yes, in my, in my I agree. Way. I agree. J.K. Rowling or yeah, yeah, no shit. You know, H.P. Lovecraft. That list could just yeah. H.P. Lovecraft is actually starting to come around before he died. Yeah. Well, and still not yeah. not. I mean, for that time, he was starting to come around. But that's that's a topic for another day. Hey, mm-hmm. Hashtag H.P. Lovecraft's cat. Yeah. Right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and the last thing I wanted to bring up is uh, when we talk about. Uh, the, the comics code and, and McFarlane's con- contribution to it. One of the things I find s- extremely interesting is he left Marvel in late 91 to form Image in 92. In 93 is when we get the Maximum Carnage series from Spider-Man, mm-hmm. which McFarlane had already uh, invented Venom uh, and started to... to uh, that whole Venom storyline where Venom, yes, killed people. He was supposed to be a villain, but again... He had good reasons. He only killed criminals, like mm-hmm. this whole thing. Maximum Carnage is like taking that because you introduce Cletus Cassidy, and it just takes it to like, the nth degree because he's a serial killer with a symbiote suit and everything else. Well, and I find it interesting that McFarlane had to leave Marvel and start his own company 
for Marvel to allow the storylines that McFarlane wanted to do in the first place. Yes. I mean, another parallel is that Venom was Spider-Man and Carnage was the Punisher. Yes. It's like, if you take this to its extreme... Right. Where do, you, where do you end up with... And, yeah, again, it took McFarlane leaving, and then Marvel kind of went... Oh, shit. Mar- Image oh, is making money. They're, they're doing... Mm. What was that McFarlane thing he was working on? Quick, run with that. Right. So, so um, I'm going to ask two, because uh, I know none of us, if we can uh, can avoid it, will ever watch that movie again. Oh, I, I might. No, no. <laughs> I might, and you might just because I might. I love that. It depends on how much I've had to drink. Exactly. And if you have the remote. <laughs> yep. Uh, <laughs> I, I might watch that again. Yeah. I love disaster movies, but that's just a tragedy movie. <laughs> yeah, no, the movie I wouldn't watch. The series, however. So here's yes. where I'm going to go okay. for Bear and Jen, is will you keep watching the cartoon, and will you keep reading the comic? So we'll start with Bear. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think I've already actually watched... I think I've already actually watched through the second season. Third season is like the full-on war. Oh, yeah. Which is great. Yeah, I haven't gotten that far yet, but I'm pretty sure I've watched through the second season already. Okay. Um, And, yeah, I mean, maybe now that I'm actually, like, caught up with the rest of the season on reading, maybe I'll get around to actually reading some things for... Well, and you can get graphic novels for ten dollars. Oh yeah, hey, there is that. Yeah. Hey, you buddy. Hey, buddy. Hey, you, want you want some, some spawn? <laughs> some spawn. I got. It, I got it cheap. Or you could be that dude in the alley. Click, click, click. So, Jen, are we going to are we going to watch second season of the cartoon? I, I'm interested now, especially after what Troy said oh, they get um, about budget. the development. They get a budget. Um, yeah, they do. Also, also. You know, my life would not be complete without mocking Todd McFarlane's openings. Oh, God. It's just one of those... Have you ever woken up? It's just one of those days. Right? I, that whole... Yeah. That, Everything that one that fucked. was just like, everybody, everybody sucks. sucks. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm Todd McFarlane, creative spawn. Yeah. Uh, Troy, a different question for you. Is sure. this going to encourage you to go back and do another read? Um, I think I'll read it up to a point. Okay. Because and 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 I will I will avoid spoilers because I have the I've last read... thing I ever heard about Spawn is there was like a green he fought the green yes at one point oh man it's so it's like him versus Swamp I, I Thing I think there's one thing we I'm can't... familiar because we yeah. covered the green in that other yeah there's one thing we can touch upon that we haven't yet about Spawn and and it's it's it will what I'm going to talk about will lead into that discussion maybe we can have it briefly is. Because Spawn had so many other people contributing to it, you had Neil Gaiman and, 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 and Frank Miller and everyone else throwing a little bit of their stuff in there, it created a very broad universe for Spawn to live in. And it's it created many spin-offs and other things like that. Did it create a spawning pool? Yes. Oh. Yes, we'll go there. We'll go there. Oh. <laughs> but, thanks, everybody. This has been the last episode of Gravity <laughs> Novel. It's like... Gib slap him or something. <laughs> this is her life. <laughs> the 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 confusing part of it is if anyone goes out to like Wikipedia and tries to read anything on this, like I, I did last night. I made that just, mistake. Ju- is just the fact that they have had to retcon so much because <laughs> of ne- the lawsuit with Neil Gaiman mm-hmm. over the character rights. Um, the selling off of different intellectual properties to Marvel and to other studios that they then couldn't use anymore. Right. So the story of the universe of Spawn has become so convoluted and retconned that it's hard when you get to a certain point in that series to go, what the hell's happening? They made choices that I won't spoil, but I, I hinted on upon. There's no female character that it doesn't get introduced that eventually is... The, the target of abuse, as you said, or uh, being taken over by someone else right. and controlled. Right. That changes a lot of the dynamics you see at the beginning. Like, what are the motivations of Spawn? What are the motivations of, of Wanda and Terry and Wynn and all the stuff that that change as they have to retcon things? They go in, they go in very interesting directions that I, I love. You know, the whole Angela thing, when, they, when you get to the point in the comic where they start... Going at it, I will just say that there's a point where Spawn goes to heaven. Yes. He is... Is he white? 
No. Like, <laughs> okay. as just in, as Spawn. in the Spawn costume. Yeah. And, and the yeah. thing that the, the comic has only just started to hint at is his costume. Right. Okay. And actually, I had a question about that. So if Meloja is just like this demon dude, and then the Violator is either in his Violator, like what he actually looks like, his or the form. clown. It's his native form, but yeah. Why right. is Spawn, like why does Spawn have such an elaborate outfit? Okay, I can kind of hint about this. One of the things that you need to say, that the comics take a while, but the the movie just comes out and says it, is that Spawn is made out of necroplasm. Okay. His right. body is necroplasm. There's a, there's points in the comics where he goes and finds his body, and it's there. It's like, how can you have both? He, he does that right away in the in the yes. cartoon. Yes. yes. Yeah. He digs up his own grave. And, and that's one of the questions that, yeah. like, how is this possible? Like, So he is made of necroplasm. The costume is a parasitic symbiote. Okay. Kind of like Venom. Yeah. But it's from hell. Right. But what I don't understand is, like, why is it so elaborate? Because the 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 purpose of the hell spawn is Malbolgia basically finds these these human souls that have certain characteristics he wants that are that are warriors that that have the potential for evil who have also killed who have that killed. is very important they have to, to have him. the yeah. potential to do horrific things they may not have been but they have to have touched upon that ideal and have embraced it at certain okay. points so he is playing a game with every hell spawn. It's the, I'm going to take you, I'm going to send you back for whatever reason that you made the deal for me for, and I'm going to give you an enormous amount of power. And see what you do with it. And let's see what you do with it. Right. Now, I could get into more details, but it starts to spoil the plot. Right. right. As to, but it well, comes down to there's there's a price. <laughs> there's always a price. Right. And, and I wants... felt like, you know, and I understand that the, the comic goes on and more gets explained because the first volume is only... Six it's six, six issues, issues and you barely touch on and, half and, of the you know, story because ideas. I saw the movie and the animated series before I read the comic I know that the suit has power yes. I know that it costs him to use that power and it's not really explained that much in the comic I think in the first six issues in in the movie because the because Cagliostro at the very end of the movie he's talking to Spawn about your costume right and he's talking about you know you need to learn to use your costume. Right. Because it's a symbiote. Spawn doesn't know this at, the, at this point in the comics. Um, and it is, a, it is an entity that has its own power. Right. Well, it is mentioned about not wasting my power when, he, when, when Spawn fights. Oh, and I totally forgot to bring up Overt Kill. Right. Oh. <laughs> that was yes. my only oh. other note. From overt the Kill. I was yes. like, Which was a contest. Okay. Are you... Really fast, me? really fast, and then I'll make my point sure, and sure. ask my question to you. I have to, because I did write this down. Okay, the character's name is Overt Kill. Overt Kill, but often called Overkill. Okay, so Overt Kill is done openly, not secret or hidden, right? Correct. Right. Overkill is excessive use, too, mu too much, mm -hmm. the amount of which destruction exceeds what is necessary. Yes. So... Overkill describes the character. Yes. Overt kill describes the intent of the character. Yes. Okay. So, the story of Overkill. Overt. S overt yeah. kill. Overt. Well, yes. He was originally Overkill because Rob Liefeld, who we have discussed on the show before, can, many many pockets cannot draw legs. Yes. Uh, yes, yes. And Todd McFarlane met Stanley. And there was some sort of, like, show or contest or something where Stan Lee gave them the challenge to make a character named Overkill. That was the only stipulation. So they both made them. Well, the problem with that was it was on, like, some show or some whatever. Right. So they couldn't use the They show couldn't use like, them oh, because God. they didn't own the characters. Right. Mm -hmm. So McFarlane made very minor Changes to what he did visually and named it Overt Kill. Which is sad to me that that's the actual story of that character because the idea of the fact that you would name the character Overt Kill mm -hmm. and, you know, be like, okay, you know, yeah. I'm doing yeah. this, you know, whatever. And then actually the character is Overkill. Mm -hmm. Like, literally. He just yeah. loves, yeah. His yeah. Yeah. loves his work. Loves his work. Did you expect, like... 
nuance. And... Well, but like I mentioned before, there were things that I came into. It's like, it, like. Give me something to break. No, it's. Give it's, me something to break. It's there. There are times in my life which have contributed to imposter syndrome, where people have attributed things to me because of things that I have said. They're like, oh, yes, you're very whatever, you know? And like, okay, well, maybe I could be that, but really I just meant All this thing. Is, and don't reading don't Todd McFarlane, I totally felt like that. Mm. Like, I'm like, oh, I could read into this. And I'm like, mm, but no, I don't think he really I, had I, that I thought. Yeah, you shouldn't I don't do think that he got that deep. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but, I, I, yeah. Just, just to jump in real quick on the, the overkill, I liked it because I felt... It was a necessary thing to do in the Spawn comic mm-hmm. to say this isn't just heaven and hell stuff. Right. There is right. A, and we're not just talking about our other intellectual properties of, oh, uh, uh, you know, uh, Savage Dragon and Young Bloods. This is something beyond what you would normally encounter. That's machine. That's human. That's like it basically says this world has stuff you're not that yours doesn't. Right. Yeah, but I kind of felt like because of the whole conspiracy theory of the mafia goes back to Rome to the Vatican, right. it, that's tied into the heaven house shit. And, and that could be, but I'm just saying, but it was just a way of going, here's something that unless you walk that road, mm-hmm. it's just this is something that exists in the world and it's a threat. Yeah. And it's just like and no one's no one is going, "Oh my god, what is this?" They're all like, "Oh, it's overkill and he's in town." Yeah. They're like, we just got to stay low and, you know, and maybe... Stay out of his way. All all the government was doing was watching when he came in and left. They were staying the hell out of his way. Yeah. And I mean, I think that just that little bit set so much of a stage for how the world works without having to explain it. Right. I do just want to point out that if you go to, um, to YouTube, there, there is a video, it's a nine minute video of this show that happened, and I'm trying to get to the beginning credits, The Comic Book Greats is the name of the show. Oh, please. <laughs> no, just keep going. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to keep going because we're recording and right, it not right, playing right, sound. Right. Well, yeah. But you can find it on YouTube, mm-hmm. and uh, it is overkill dash Todd McFarlane, Rob Liefeld, Stanley. This is just part one. Yeah. So uh, it exists out there, and you can watch it, where they create these characters. So I think that by dint of being like a, an idiot savant, Todd McFarlane has pulled me in. Because I'm just like, okay, well, all right, so here's the Vatican. is the, He's hinting at the Vatican yeah. being in charge of the mafia. But then there's this shadow person who seems to be above the mafia and the American government that's pulling strings. I'm like, all right, where are we going? Let's, what is this conspiracy rabbit hole? That tune in, down? tune in next season when Jen is just going to start talking about how Spawn is the greatest comic that is ever. And there's yarn all over <laughs> it. <laughs> <laughs> that, that thing I was talking about, how the, 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 the universe just keeps getting bigger. Yeah. They, they, they go in to explain the bureaucracy of heaven. What's going on with heaven. What Angela is. Yeah. Not to be confused with the Angelus from the, Witchblade, Dark right, Trilogy. Right. Yes. But, you know, who she is, what she does, where her powers come from. This is this has really just made me more curious about how exactly she came over to the Marvel Universe, too. I don't know. I, I know she did. Yeah. I read about that. And then that. she became a Guardian of the Galaxy. Like, she was in the Guardians of the Galaxy, the last Guardians of the Galaxy comic I read. And I was like, that's Angela. Yeah. <laughs> It's like not the not the character I respect in the Marvel universe, but, right? But there there's there's such a depth to the the Spawn universe that I like a lot of the characters that they introduce, and I want to know more about them. Sam and you know, Sam, Sam and Bird Twitch and Twitch, yeah. They're they're great examples of that. You know, Cagliostro. Uh, I mean, I love the character. I love what he represents, and then the direction they end up taking with him. Mm. It just like I said, disappointment disappointment with where I think they went and that could just be because they the retconning and such just got so overwhelming much like with Marvel and the X-Men oh, or yeah, absolutely. DC and Batman yeah. like well what is the actual origin you know did he watch Zorro because now that would be you know the 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 old the new Batman stuff would be what he was watching with his parents if he was perpetually 32 right the Joel Schumacher Batman is what he and his parents were watching that <laughs> night but, also 97 yes. Batman and Robin yep yep 
mean, Ice to meet you. I highly recommend that people oh. give a read to Spawn and continue through with comics until you reach the point where it just becomes too much. Yeah. yeah. It just gets lost in its own ideals and then just go to Wiki and read the summaries. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Read everything else. I just like and I what keep the thinking headaches. about like the the small portion that I've been exposed to so far, and like all of the like social commentary and conspiracy theory, whatever. And it's just like I feel like there has to be some purpose and and intent behind it because yes. there's so much there. there, there I feel is. like I feel like the cartoon is going to be something that when we're watching a main show, but like. Like, we're watching Lock and Key Season 2 right now, and <gasps> you talk about how, for some reason, out of everything we watch, it stresses you out so much in your neck you get very tense watching it. Yeah. Like, that would be a good cool down yeah. after something like that. Hashtag watch Lock and Key. It's so good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Re- Lock and Key, Midnight Mass. Oh, Jesus. Midnight Mass was amazing. Oh. Yeah. Uh, we we do sometimes watch shit. That is not for this show. <laughs> I fi- did finish Cowboy Bebop, and now I actually want to do an episode on the comparison oh, between them. Because, the anime and the yeah. God, it was so good. But anyway. Uh, Troy, thank you so much for joining us sure, once fun. again. Uh, we will we will definitely get you back on yeah. at some point we, down we the road. We always the greatest discussions of... Yeah. Uh, once I convince these two that we need to do a Titans episode... Oh, God. <laughs> Which I don't know if you've started to watch the show yet. I, I have not, and it's just, uh, with many things, like with Spawn, you at least you have a, this is yeah. this, and with Titans, you have which version? You're going, I'm going to tell you now, you're going to have a problem with the first season. Which I've is heard. why this is the one episode that I've pitched that we watched the second season for the show, because the second season is so much better. Uh, I mean... Not only because Raven, the whole first season centers around Raven. Raven's a hard character to like base a, a non-comic book yes. TV thing off of. And then Raven goes away after first season, okay. so it gets better. You do have to still, still deal with Starfire, who I know your wife despises with the fury that burns like a thousand suns. I mean, but <laughs> just as a real quick side tangent, I, I think a lot of it comes down to if with... with the you know, Robin slash uh, Nightwing. Nightwing. Uh, Dick Grayson. It's you either are a fan of when he was on the Titans with Starfire, right? Or you're a fan of the later stuff of Chuck Dixon, where he and Babs were together. Is that the Outsiders? No, no. It was oh, like okay. just, just it was it was post uh, uh, Night's End. Okay. When he went to Bloodhaven and basically had his own comic. Gotcha. That era is is the you know when he's not part of the team he's just on his own and, and doing this the relationships it's you either like one or the other you don't find many people that like both. Maybe we'll even do third season because third season is when they bring Babs in. Well, she's a little bit in second season, but mm-hmm. third season is really when they bring Babs in. Yeah, and uh, awesome, awesome. Cool. Anyway, cool. Uh, not Spawn. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for listening uh, as I look up what we're doing next because I don't remember. Uh, please tune in next time when we do Bear. Bear is going to take the reins for the majority of this episode because we are doing Jupiter's Legacy. Oh, oh so good. <laughs> so good. And Bear came to us after watching this and went, guys, guys, <laughs> you're going to do this. And Jen and I literally... Uh, we do not go through the entire season. We did half in one day and half the next day. It was yeah, I'm quick. Not, I am not usually a binge watcher. No. I need to I need to unpack things. I need to right. watch it and unpack it and then move on. But that one, we binged. But And there was a lot to unpack. Yeah, there was a lot to unpack. But the way that... And I think that it, that's credit to the way it was made because i can sit through three and a half four hour movie mm-hmm. and think that it's only been an hour mm-hmm. if it's well made right like doom like doom oh yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes <laughs> jen actually got up at a certain point she's like i can't wait anymore i have to use the restroom but it's okay they're 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 in a spot where i think i could just go and then she came back and the credits were rolling yeah. oh no <laughs> <laughs> 
on me. She's like, what happened? I'm like, like, one thing. And <laughs> and I was just like, but I need more. It's only been, holy crap. Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I'm like, I need more movie. More movie. In my veins. More, in my more vein. June. Yeah. More June. Uh, but yes, Jupiter's Legacy, and I'm, I might, may even talk about Super Crooks, too. Excellent. Uh, yeah, we may need to watch some of that. Uh, but until then, take it away, Vandello.